Um, thank you all for coming. Um, I have no musical in the interlude, so you'll have to just remember Jamie's performance. Um, but normally I have started taking with, with the tedious vignettes, and today is no different. <laughs> so I want to take you to the parish of St. Nicholas in Aberdeen in November 1608, where Catherine Wright met with her son, Gilbert Keith, the bastard son of the old marshal. Gilbert had a child that needed milk, and he had heard that his mother had a wet nurse staying in her house. His mother asked if he was the father of the child, to which Gilbert responded, if it stands in need, I will be father to it. Adding, perhaps ominously, keep it secret, it stands on my life. Now Gilbert, as some of you might know, had built up quite a reputation with the ministers of the North East over the previous year, and this is just a small list of the things he was known for. He refused to take the confession of faith. He was implicated in the setting off of midsummer fires. He was also implicated in a plot to vandalise the parish church of St. Nicholas in Aberdeen. If that wasn't bad enough, he'd also abandoned his wife to save the peerhead and moved in with a woman in Old Aberdeen. This guy is legendary in some of his works. Now, knowing of her son's rather questionable reputation with the authorities, Catherine Wright mobilised her son's client network and immediately passed the baby girl to Elspeth Innes, the wet nurse who lived in her household. The following Monday, Elspeth received a visit from Bessie Smith, a servant and niece of Margaret Forbes, who provided the foster mother with blankets, sheets and eight mounts of silver. Bessie told Elspeth uh, that um, to take the baby inland, away from the prying eyes of the concession, and to treat the bear well, she should want nothing. The next day, Bessie returned with William Keith, a servant to one of Gilbert's trusted kinsmen. William was on his way to a horse 20 miles inland, and he took Elspeth out of the town along the hunting road to the west. He stopped at the house of Christian Hogg and her daughter at the small village of Glasgow, south of Canella. Elspeth attended the child for the next two weeks before it died, burying its body just outside of Canella Parish Church. Now, as the baby lay in the house for that fortnight, Christian Hogg's daughter, Margaret, said the child looked frighteningly. Now, when a river broke out in Aberdeen that Forbes had borne a child to Gilbert Keith, the local session burst into action. But as it cited all of the parties involved in the case, obtaining information on the baby's journey out of Aberdeen along the way, the session received the same answer from each of the witnesses it cited. They could not know for sure whose ox there. Now, studies of this sort of thing are rightly dominated by Margaret Todd's magisterial work for the culture of Scottish Protestants. And Todd's work showed the sheer scope of, of parish-based activity in early modern Scotland and the way in which parishes gradually adopted the changes of the Reformation to fit perhaps with their day-to-day -day lives. Now this is not to say that reviewers were uncritical of Todd's work though. Now in addition to some blowback confidence of Todd's assertions, reviewers were uneasy with the way Todd selected examples from across a wide time period, and in a move that seemed to fly in the face of work by Michael Lynch and others, selected case studies from both rural and urban parishes we see in impunity. Now Keith Brown felt this lack of differentiation was unhelpful, while Julian Goodyear at Edinburgh suggested that this single decision seriously would But much of this criticism, I think, was indicative of a more significant and perhaps largely hidden problem that we need to talk about more, which is how change happened in different contexts around Scotland. Now, Alan MacDonald uh, summarised that in cultures of Protestantism, the complexities and grey areas were just left to speak for themselves. And Mark Graham and Akron went further and suggested that while Todd put forward the idea of a slow process of religious change in his deceptively simple phrasing, she never took us through that process. 
Now today I want to just do two things in a small way. By exploring cases of illegitimacy and childcare, I want to show the parish as what Keith writes and call a messy scheme of interconnected relationships. But the second is to underline how some of the complexities of parish-based negotiation of religious change, and particularly um, how proactive members of the community could demand change, or, or at least be active in this process. This is kind of the, the individuals in the East who, who don't necessarily leave the records behind. Changing things in the course of their lives. Let's become a mainstay of studies of early modern Protestantism in Scotland to reflect on the complex interest in controlling the kind of illicit sexuality you see in cases like your Keats. And it's only until quite recently that people um, haven't really studied this in, in much detail. Now, clearly, illegitimate children were extensive to the parish, they created uh, social scandals, and moreover, they undermined the uh, aims to create a, a godly community. But what happened once illegitimate children were born and their mothers and fathers publicly shamed is not the way Such cases clearly raise the prospect of broken familial units, unless the community or possession at large provided some kind of adequate care and the family unit was, in many ways, as, as Margaret Thomas suggested, the Protestant seminary of early modern Europe, a place in which heads of household imbued doctrinal laws. This is not news to everybody. But how this family was composed, however, was not something that reform authorities in Scotland attempted to consistently manage. And Stephen Osby has shown some of these and instead, Kirk authorities accepted a variety of different, and often, this way, the community led uh, models of care to ensure that illegitimate children did not fall into penury. But local authorities were aware of these networks, and, but the key thing for me is they often have little involvement in the organisation or management of them. And here's the real key thing they don't really intervene at the behest of the carers themselves. So this repositions the reform magistrate as part of the parish in which it served, and not solely at the apex of that community. So at first glance, local concessions across the lowlands particularly seem to betray a remarkable lack of knowledge about who was caring for who in their parishes. You sometimes have to read between the lines of this thing. But we see a few um, positive examples from across Scotland. So in July 1619, Thomas Fraser, brother to the Lord Fraser of Muckles, appeared before the session of St. Nicholas again in Aberdeen to explain why he was so often in the company of one Elspeth Patton, a woman with a less than virtuous reputation. Now Fraser rejected any suggestion that he spent the night with Patton that day, but emphasized how he comes now and then to give her means for entertainment of his bed. The bishop in session reproved Fraser for his presence at the house, but seemed genuinely surprised at his behaviour. But here's the thing. Fraser had previously appeared before the session in October 1617, charged with committing fornication with the same woman, Alistair Patton, a liaison only revealed by the woman's subsequent pregnancy. As he said, often the case. The session was aware of Fraser's children, but was evidently not involved details of the care arrangements between him and Indeed, for most cases of fornication and adultery that before home sessions, and if you go through these records, there are not There's a complex series of negotiations regarding childcare behind the scenes that's largely off the record. That the structures of how a child got to a foster carer are often missing from these records, but they seem to have come together with little formal intervention, or at least little sessional intervention. So occasionally glimpses show the depth and complexity of these unofficial foster care So in July 1613, um, St. Nicholas and Aberdeen again 
particularly concerned about these kind of cases, cited Agnes Allen for fostering the young child who was sick of this writer's incognito patria. Gotcha. Now, Allen's recitation of the connections through which the child had reached her is full, replete of the fantastic details, and I think it's just worth it. We're worth rehearsing it in full. Being inquired who was the father and mother to that bed, and who delivered him to her keeping, she deposed she knew not who was uh, his father nor his mother. But granted that William Blackhorn, the Maltman, delivered the bed to her on the rude day last and promised to satisfy her for the, for the board of the bed so long as she kept it. And the said William Blackhorn being likewise cited before the session, compared before them, confessed that a woman brought the bairn to him and that she declared to him the bairn was James Allen's and Christian Wallace. The child that Allen had in her care at this point had already travelled through at least two, two and a half intermediaries to be with her. And the session had no idea where its parents had gone, both of whom were originally residents. There were only a handful of parish sessions actively sought involvement in the organisation of this kind of thing. Moreover, their interest tended to be limited to frankly extraordinary circumstances. So in early 1616, the session at Cannon Gates authorised a payment to Marion Morton for caring for a found bear laid down at her door and appointed her as its foster carer in the absence of anyone else. But the details are very hazy. It's unclear if the infant's mother had deliberately left the child at that woman's door because she was already a sort of recognised carer, or if the session had forced the fostering of that child onto this woman. But what we do see is that these activities underline how parish authorities may have been aware of such networks and could potentially activate them when required or become involved in them in the street. Those involved in foster care arrangements could make use of ecclesiastical authorities to settle disputes or even alter the terms of their original oral agreement. In this way, again, the session just becomes a service within the community, part of that community, not necessarily a sort of, it's easy to say, but not necessarily a browbeating, top down sort of jurisdiction. Local women frequently resorted to local public sessions and by doing so, briefly exposed care arrangements to the community and to historians subsequently, but up to that point, had remained completely on the So in February 1633, the session of Falkirk in the Lithgow Presbytery recorded the petition of Elizabeth Gray, who demanded that John Smith should fulfill his promise, his promise, and then the fostering his bed, either by paying for its upkeep or by taking the child into his own care and then presumably using some of his own earning power at the time that he care for it. Their private promises of financial assistance are cited in a great many other petitions. But in this way, the local session or even presbytery uh, in some high profile cases became another branch of this wider nexus of communal relationships, the sort of thing that Craig Muldrew. Uh, assess in England that could enforce on women oaths or promises. These are credit relationships that you'll see in the come. The session's value in this was that it could witness these settlements and guard against either party rejecting the legality or even the very existence of these agreements later on. So in December 1634, the session at Stirling ordered John Adam and Margaret Morrison to discuss betwixt themselves the, the, the sustaining of their legitimate charge. The only form of intervention offered by the session, or perhaps even solicited by the petitioners, was that two of its members were appointed to be owners, to ensure that the mother and father reached some kind of settlement and then to act as witnesses, not guarantors, of that agreement. In the year that followed, so long process, the session exerted more pressure on an increasingly obstinate um, John Adam to ensure that he reached an agreement with the mother of his child. 
finally, in February 1636, this started in December 1634, just to remind you, Adam's father appeared before the session and agreed to act as guarantor that his son would take possession of the child on the first day. Now, in this case, the session policed informal discussion and used the threat of further intervention to establish the conditions of the settlement. At the same time, though, as John Adam and Margaret Morrison entered into these discussions, 25 miles to the south in Midcalder, the session there witnessed a similar statement where Jean Lowry handed over her child to its biological father, John Adams. And I cite this because. In the record, the clerk makes it quite clear that the handover was done in presence of the whole session, providing some kind of legal backing for the transfer of parental responsibility in this kind of closed session environment. The session's prominence in the parish provided a space and a framework into which informal discussions could enter and then exit stage as and when necessary. So, ecclesiastical Authorities were intimately aware of how foster care operated within their local communities. Elders and deacons in sessions across Scotland were often intimately involved in these networks as members of their respective parishes, as well as when they put their sessional hands on every week. But while authorities wished to reduce social scandal arising from these networks, they frequently stopped short of controlling them entirely. Now, indeed, elders and deacons would really become involved themselves in the activities um, of, of informal care networks in an official capacity. This is not because of lack of awareness or of resources. It's by design. These are just managed by the community. So how do you connect this kind of paper to the, to the theme of this conference? What does this mean for my very humble opinion? Our studies of early modern Scotland generally. Well, the first thing that I'd just like to suggest is that we can use the parish as a tool or a unit to complicate existing narratives of religious, social, or even political changes we're seeing in studies of the 17th century at the moment. It's no longer sufficient to ascribe change to these top down or bottom up processes. Todd's work established a new default position for us, that of negotiate change without fully exploring what this meant in terms of agency, in terms of demand, or even indeed in terms of local power politics that the parish level. Now the second thing that I think we need to uh, re-embrace is that local case studies need to be deployed to uncover the conditions of this kind of negotiation that I've tried to introduce you to. One of the consequences of Margaret Todd's work was for historians, and I include myself in this statement, was for us to move away from looking at parish-based history seriously and move towards talking about Scotland in its entirety. That's from the Galtag right down to the borders. What Todd's work should have done was remind us of the tremendous nature of archival material from Scots parishes and push us towards testing her assertions. Now, thankfully, we've seen some moves towards this, and I think the rate of travel is getting quicker. And in this respect, John McCann's work on Fife was perhaps more of a benchmark than we might appreciate. Jamie's paper uh, on the East Nuke, uh, which will be published soon, we're saying this morning, Catherine McMillan's recent thesis on the Northeast, and the uh, recent uh, newer work from Claire McNaught here at Queen's Belfast. The central bar of Mount Sugar, local studies have much to reveal. Margaret Todd's more recent work, in fact, on the intricacies of change in Perth seems to be picking up on this trend and also as a sort of direct response to some of the critiques of the viewers. Furthermore, in a shameless plug or a shameful plug, I hope the publication <coughs> is like the minutes of the cinema you know, tweet out. I don't have any here to purchase. Um, but other similar publications by Scottish History Society, Scott Spurlock's forthcoming ventures with National Records of Scotland, and Julian and Alan's work, uh, Tent, will further give us frameworks to push us in this kind of direction. 
as Reformation scholars like uh, Muller, Leitch in the 20th century, these local studies are essential for it to understand the conditions of change more clearly. Now, there's one more thing before I leave. And it's whereas I feel that Todd's work perhaps moved us away from the detailed analysis of the mechanics of change that we've discussed. There's one thing that Todd's work did from which we should not retreat. The Scottish Reformation, we're talking long Reformation, quote John McCallum, is now far more connected to discussions of reform parties elsewhere in Europe than ever before. And Keith Brand summarises nicely in SHR's 10-year review of Scottish historical studies in 2011, when he claimed that studies of the Reformation in Scotland are now addressing some of the most compelling arguments and issues in the field at large, not just in Scotland. But this has an unexpected benefit. Local studies need not be seen as parochial or of limited importance because they seek to engage, they should be seeking to engage with studies of broadly Calvinist change elsewhere. Scotland now is frequently included and in increasing detail in studies relating to different forms of Calvinism and Calvinisms that proliferated across Europe. So that Puritan nation that appears in Margaret Todd's conclusion, a magisterial monograph was one of many undergoing similar changes, and it's our job to work out the final contours of this man perform. And it's the parish that will be at the heart of this work, uh, assessing negotiation in the years to come. Thank you for listening.